Hello and welcome to Nature Knowledge. This is a speaker series with experts sharing scientific knowledge on current issues affecting nature in Florida. I'm your host, Dr. Shelley Johnson, State Specialized Agent in Natural Resources with University of Florida IFAS Extension. Thanks for joining us today. Today, this is a special day um, for those of you that are maybe new to this program. I've been hosting it for about a year and a half and Today is the first day that I am both hosting and I'm also the speaker. So I am super excited. This is one of my absolute uh, favorite topics. And I am putting this presentation together. I realized I wanted to talk about every single thing about bats. And so um, basically what I'm going to try and do is at least cover some of the most frequently asked questions that I get about bats in Florida. Um, definitely trying to spell some of the myths and misconceptions and provide a little bit of a quick snapshot of um, bats in Florida, but also bats in general, so that all of you are also better equipped to answer questions should you get them from folks. I mean, obviously around Halloween, everyone's thinking a lot about bats, but really they are around all year round and just as important in other times of the year. So. A little about me, I know you know me from hosting this program, but I have had a long history with doing bat work. Um, first worked with bats when I started doing wildlife rehab many years ago in Central Texas, and the bats were just such cool things. We would get them in and they sometimes would just need a few days to recuperate and fly away. And I was immediately um, so impressed and enamored by them. And several years later, I ended up working as a wildlife technician in Arizona. Um, bat diversity there is absolutely amazing. And I then went forward and did my master's degree on bats in Northern Arizona, looking at bat habitat use in Ponderosa Pine Forest. And later on, I worked in Wyoming as a bat biologist there for a year and a half doing uh, nest netting and hibernacula surveys. And that was an amazing experience as well. So. I'm now in Florida and I'm wearing a lot of hats here as state specialized agent in natural resources. And I'm really hoping to be able to expand more of my bat outreach. So this is, this is a part of that. So I'm really glad you're all interested in being here today. And I'm gonna try and cover a lot of things as I said. So let's get started. Um, first, a quick little bat biology 101. Bats are just so unique. They're one of the most amazing creatures to me. And so I just wanna share that amazingness with you. And one of the really amazing things about them is that they're the only mammal with truly powered flight. So no other mammal truly flies. Their order is Choroptera, which means hand wing. And if you look at the structure, um, it truly is their fingers, which are making up the wing. And the process which, which they fly is different than any other animal too, as far as comparing it to bats or um, other insects that fly. So, and also, it, you know, one of the misconceptions, the uh, kind of things people will say is that they're like flying mice. And they're actually not very closely related to mice at all. And so uh, newer genetic data has allowed people to reclassify it much more closely related to ungulates and carnivores. And actually you can see up above here, the primates, uh, meaning us humans, and rodents up here are actually closely, more closely related to each other than either of us are related to bats. So there's a little fun fact for you. The other, another really interesting thing about bats is that they're very small and long lived. And so a general rule for mammals is that typically the smaller the body size, the shorter lived the animal and the more offspring they have. And bats completely break that rule. They're very small and they have very few offspring. So in general, each mother only has one pup, which is what we call baby bats, each year. Um, some species tend to have twins. So still like maybe two pups a year 
is very low for such a small animal. And also they can live up to over 30 years. Um, certainly in the wild that can vary, but that's a very long lived time frame for such a small animal. Another really cool thing about bats is that they have sonar. And so one of the myths is that they're blind. They're absolutely not blind. Uh, they can see, however, they have evolved echolocation as a way to navigate in the dark, uh, which allows them to chase down very small prey, allows them to navigate around uh, cluttered environments in the forest. And so what basically happens is the bat is essentially yelling um, or calling like a, like a bird does. And so as they're calling, they're pulsing out these sounds. And when that sound wave hits something, it bounces back. And this happens to all of us. We just humans don't have developed enough ears in order to be able to hear that echo. And so the bat has very developed ears. They're able to hear that echo back. And as they get closer and closer to whatever it is that's in front of them, they're able to narrow down on what, where that object is. Now you can think this is pretty amazing if that object is a tiny mosquito that's also moving. And so uh, it's just pretty amazing to me. So here's a kind of a cool little graphic showing what that looks like. So the bat is yelling out and then those sound waves bounce off the moth and then come back. And this is actually how bat biologists study the identity of bats, if you will. Like, so we can put out a detector in the forest, which is recording these calls. Um, and then we can, these are, this is what the sound waves look like. So different bat species have different frequencies. So they're at different higher or lower frequencies. And then also have different, um, the shape of the sound wave looks different. So it looks different on the screen. So we can actually tell a lot of differences based on recordings like this. And if we could hear if these if if bat calls are actually in our hearing range, it would be extremely loud. And so think of a fire detector if you had it right next to your ear. That's kind of how loud it would be for the bats when they're calling out. Um, I like to think of what if imagine you're out in the forest and you know, there's hundreds of bats flying around, and if you you could actually hear them calling, what would that sound like? I mean, it would be maybe like a little bit too much for us. Um, so it's kind of just something kind of interesting to think about. Another uh, unfounded fear. Uh, no one really knows how this started, but bats do not fly into your hair. Uh, bats don't want to fly into your hair. They want nothing to do with your hair. Um, and bats are actually very adept flyers. And so part of their development of echolocation allows them to see things even when there's very low light, even though they can see when it's light enough out. Um, there's different adaptations of different bat species. So some have longer, thinner wings, and those are very fast bats, and they can pursue insects on the wing. So they're actually eating them in their mouth or catching them in their tail and putting them in their mouth while they're flying at very quick speeds. There's other bats that are uh, broader wings, and those are adapted to hovering and gleaning prey off of vegetation. And all this to say is that they can chase down things and maneuver around things very easily. So often if people think there's bats kind of coming at them, it's most likely because they also have insects swarming around their head and the bats trying to narrow in and eat that insect. So. Another uh, thing to mention is definitely people do get, be con become concerned with bats when we talk about rabies. And it is true that bats can harbor diseases such as rabies. However, it's often not as high percentage as people think. So it's thought to be about less than a half percent or less than 1% of bats actually are carrying rabies. And so it's actually a very rare disease and it's very unlikely that um, you're going to get rabies from a bat. And really, unless you're coming into direct contact and touching a bat, you're almost no chance you're ever going to get rabies. There's a lot of other animals that actually have much higher incidence of rabies. And so they're kind of um, maligned in that way. But 
bats do have a very unique immune system. And even pretty recently, there's a lot of research going on to understand better how they're able to harbor a lot of disease while staying relatively healthy. Um, so in general, bats are not going to spread disease unless we encroach on them. So the more we're encroaching on their habitat, the more we're coming in contact with them, the more likely disease is to be spread. Okay, so look a little bit at the diversity of bats in general and then in Florida. So here's the answer, dun, dun, dun. there are 1400 species plus worldwide. So the plus, and I think some of you got this or a lot of you were really close. Some of you had slightly lower numbers or slightly higher numbers. And this is an interesting number because it keeps growing. And part of that is because of genetics potentially helping us identify that maybe certain species are actually different when we may have classified them previously as the same species. And also we're still finding bats. So we're, you know, especially you think of tropical areas, we're finding new species. And so this is another um, reason why we need to think about, you know, conserving habitat before it's too late and we lose these species. So there's also a really a large diversity of bats in that we have very large bats in the world. Uh, we have the mega cropper bats, which are the old world fruit bats. And these are very large, can have up to a six foot wingspan, which is basically like a six foot tall human. And they're mostly relying on their night vision when they're going out in the evening, possibly smell, and they're feeding on fruiting trees primarily. So we do not have the, any Megacroptera in the US, but if you live in North Central Florida and you are around this weekend, the Luby Bat Fest is happening and they do have a colony of Megacroptera that you can visit. So that's a good opportunity to see them. And then there's also really tiny bats. And so this is one of the smallest bats, it's the bumblebee bat. And this is the Microcroptera, which is basically all of the other bats. So most of the bats in the Americas are Microcroptera, all the bats in the United States are Microcroptera, all the bats in Florida also. And these bats mostly feed on insects. There are some that also do feed on frogs, fish, uh, small lizards, scorpions, things like that. And these bats almost uh, really rely on echolocation in order to hunt at night. Um, although again, they're not blind. So if it's light enough out, they can still see with their eyes. So in the US, there's 48 species nationwide. Again, all these are Microcroptera and most are insectivorous. There are a few uh, nectar and flower feeders. And this is another um, chance to sneak in a little tidbit on frequently asked question. So vampire bats are not in the US. Uh, they're primarily in Central and South America. Their range is slowly expanding. So it's not impossible that at some point they may end up in Florida. However, I'm preemptively trying to uh, let you know that they're not generally a threat at all to humans. They primarily feed on ungulates and birds. Uh, this picture is probably a chicken foot. And so they just sneak up to an animal in the night. They make a little tiny slit, drink up enough blood that fills their tiny little belly, and then they're done. And um, they're actually doing some interesting research to study the anticoagulants that are in this bat saliva in order to think about how we can apply that to human medicine. So. Okay, so here in Florida, we have 33 species that live here year round. Two of those are residents, uh, are listed as federally endangered and seven other species above and beyond the 13 do occasionally or accidentally come through the state. And the bats here in Florida are average about eight, 10 inches up to 12 or 14 inches for the largest ones. So really that's, you know, thinking of maybe this wide of a wingspan. 
and body length is maybe two, maybe three inches at most. So they're really very small, um, six, eight, 10 grams. The very, very largest ones would be 30 or maybe a little bit more grams. And even that is less than think of a size of about a chicken egg in weight. So these are very small bats. Um, often people think of the large megacoptera of fruit bats and they see our Florida bats and they think they're maybe their babies. But actually that's as big as they get and that's the size of our um, most bats in North America as well. So here's basically the, this is the list of the 13 residents. And so we have members of the family Vespertilionidae and the family Molossidae. And you can see that two that are uh, gray bat is endangered and the Florida bonobat is endangered. And I'll talk a little bit about those a little bit later. Um, it is all bats in Florida are protected. So it's illegal to kill bats. And you also cannot use pesticide or poisons to you know, for the purpose of harming or killing or deterring them. So they're protected species, even the ones that are not listed as endangered. And a lot of this is because we don't necessarily know a ton about what they're doing and where they're going and where they live and their population size. Um, I mean, we have a fairly good idea, but it's unknown a lot about what their life cycle needs. And so it's important to protect them because they can be very vulnerable especially to disturbance to their roost. Um, and a lot of these bats will use roosts in buildings and other human-made structures. So it's important to keep in mind that it's not okay just to go in and kill them if you see them somewhere. And I'll be talking about the um, exclusions a little bit later at the end. So in general, a little bit about bat habitat. So as with all species, I like to remind everyone, um, basic functions that everyone needs, water, uh, bats will go out and often drink every evening at an open water source. They need regular food. Bats have a very high metabolism and a, if they're out being active, they need a lot of food. Um, if they don't have enough food, then they'll, and if the temperature is too cold, they'll often go into a torpor state um, in order to conserve energy. So. The other thing that's very important for the life cycle of bats is adequate shelter. And so they need shelter during the day when they're resting. They need specific type of shelter for raising their pups when they have um, during the maternity season. They have different shelters even sometimes in the middle of the night. They take a little a nap in the middle of the night. So all these things are important considerations. So in general, if we look at a lot of bats in North America overall, this is kind of the typical cycle of bats. So in the winter, they may be hibernating or migrating, not necessarily the case here in, here in Florida. In the spring, they have their maternity season. So this is when the mothers are having their pups and raising their pups. Um, generally that goes into the early summer. At that point, that's when the pups are dispersing and there's uh, mothers also dispersing and uh, other adults kind of not necessarily needing to be in that maternity colony anymore. And then in the fall is when breeding typically occurs. Another really cool thing about bats that I didn't mention is that there many species are capable of either delayed implantation or delayed fertilization. So they can actually breed uh, much earlier than they need to and then wait until the winter in order to actually start the process of growing the baby. So in Florida, specifically, our maternity season lasts from April 15th until August 15th. So during that entire time, we have mothers that are about to give birth, having birth, and then have pups and going out and feeding pups. And then their pups are at the end of that time becoming able to fly. So most bats do remain in Florida in the fall and winter, but they do become more dispersed. Um, and we also at that point would even be getting migrant species that are coming from up north, kind of getting rid of, getting away from the cold and coming down to Florida. So 
if it does get too cold, which could certainly happen, especially in northern Florida, then bats will go into a torpor um, and or, you know, they just won't go out to hunt because it's going to be too cold for them to fly, um, too cold for them to keep their body temperature up. And so it's more efficient for them to just hunker down for a few days, a week, 10 days, and just kind of wait out until it warms up. Um, so bringing this back to kind of thinking about habitat conservation and their life cycle, there's so many different habitats that they're using throughout the year. So we need to really be conscientious of where they are when and just avoiding disturbance of, of those habitats. Um, Okay, so some, in general, all of the types of habitats we might find, bats absolutely are using caves. Um, even in Florida, we have quite a few caves in Northern and some Central Florida where bats are using. We don't have, similar to other parts of the US, we don't have those really, really large colonies in caves. We absolutely have individual bats and maybe small groups using caves. Also in the hollows of dead trees, is a great place for bats to roost. They'll kind of climb up into that little cavity and it's kind of a nice protected place. Also under the bark of a dying or dead tree. So the bark kind of starts peeling away from the bole of the tree and that prevents, creates a nice little place that they can climb up in there and take a nap or even have their pups sometimes. And also they will often use the dead palm fronds. So if you're in the practice of just cutting all those dead fronds off, you might consider leaving them because that can be really great bat habitat. Um, also a lot of birds like to use that habitat. And also Spanish moss can be used as a roost for some of our foliage roosting bats. Oh, and another picture, I guess. So, and yes, also in the leaves. So if it's a good tree, they can actually even climb up under the thick vegetation in the trees. And that's another place we can find them. So a few other places, certainly they're using human-made structures. We find them in sheds, in attics, certainly under bridges. Um, in Florida, we've, we definitely find them under bridges, in culverts, um, other, uh, mines, any kind of structures like that, bats will often use. And also they will readily use bat houses if they're in a good location and in an appropriate place where they are in need of a house. And I do have several slides on bat houses because that is another one of those very frequently asked uh, question. So in Kind of a, just to tie this back to some of the bat species in Florida, these are some of the, the most common bat species that you'll encounter in the state. And this top group of five are the ones that you're more often going to find in larger colonies, in structures, in bat houses, and caves. Um, so if you've been to the University of Florida campus, there's the large bat house and the accompanying bat uh, barns. And most of the bats in there are Brazilian free-tail bats but also probably some evening bats and some of southeastern myotis. And then these bats on the bottom are more of our foliage roosters. So they're usually found in smaller groups or often even singularly. And they'll be in trees, they'll be in the palm fronds, also the Spanish moss or in leaves. Um, I did mention earlier that we have a couple of federally endangered bat species the gray bat is um, pretty rare and also very limited in range in general, but also in Florida, it's really limited to the very far northern Florida caves. And it has been listed for a long time as far as having pretty low population numbers. Um, but I did want to use this as an opportunity to throw in a little mention of white nose syndrome. Another thing people often ask about um, if you're not familiar with this, it's a fungus that has been slowly spread from cave to cave, starting in the Northeastern United States many years ago. And 
especially in the northeastern United States, it has wiped out very large colonies of bats um, when they're wintering, hibernating in their caves in the winter. So basically the fungus um, prevents them from breathing, they wake up in their hibernation. And in general, if we wake up bats when they're hibernating or when they're in torpor, then they use a lot of energy that they don't have. And that in itself can, can cause them to not live through their hibernation because they've used up those energy stores that they needed. Um, in general, I am, I like to, we're fortunate here in Florida that at this point, we do not have white nose syndrome recorded in the state, but that doesn't mean it can't be here um, or can't come here. So we don't know for sure if that will happen. We hope it won't. But if you do enter Florida caves, especially if you use your equipment in another cave system outside of Florida, um, absolutely you need to clean your gear very thoroughly before you enter any cave. And ideally you should be cleaning your gear and clothing and boots and everything in between caves. So here is a quick um, most recent map. This, I just downloaded this the other day of where white nose syndrome is. And so the, the redder and oranger colors are newer cases. And you can see not in Florida, but definitely in places in Northern Georgia, Northern Alabama and Louisiana. So it is close and we should just be cautious. One of the other endangered species is the Florida bonded bat. Uh, this bat's gotten a lot of attention recently in the state and it's actually endemic to Florida. So it's our only endemic flying mammal, which is pretty cool. And it was listed as federally endangered in 2013, primarily due to habitat loss, degradation, and also just again, because we don't necessarily know a lot of information about it. So there's been a lot of people in the last few years tracking this bat, doing radio telemetry, looking for roosts, um, doing acoustic surveys, and trying to figure out where this bat is living. So it's primarily in Southern Florida, roosting in cavities, but also under the bark of pine trees, palms, and also have been found in man-made structures. And a most recent document that I was just, just able to see was the most current uh, prediction of range based on where sightings have been. So you can see some of these are acoustic detection and some are captures at roost. And so mostly we're looking at Southern Florida and even more specifically, mostly the Southwest corner. Okay, so now some benefits of bats. They are not only amazing, they are so beneficial in so many ways. And all bats in Florida are insectivorous. They prey on nocturnal arthropods, it could be moths, beetles, mosquitoes, midges. And they're really the only major predator of these nighttime flying insects. So ecologically, they're tremendously important. That really is their role. And there are, so not in Florida, but in other places, um, a little bit in the US and certainly around the world, it's a lot of bats that are essential for nectar and fruit pollination and seed dispersal as well. So we have, a lot of people have done some great research and documented how much a bat can actually eat. It's an amazing amount. Uh, it's been documented that one small little, remember these are like, you know, this big, little insectivorous bat can eat up to a thousand mosquito sized insects in one hour. So the estimate was 150 mosquitoes in 10 minutes. So I can't even imagine how that is possible, but it's pretty, pretty amazing. And they really are essential for helping reduce the mosquito population. And we know mosquitoes are really also bad at spreading disease to humans and other animals. So we definitely want to try and get rid of mosquitoes. Other benefits are that they, not only the mosquitoes, which we know as individual humans, we find really annoying, but they're really crucial at controlling agricultural and forest pests. 
So that allows industry to actually use fewer pesticides and using fewer pesticides has its own ecological benefits for the ecosystem. And it's been estimated that uh, nationwide, bats have saved industry $23 billion per year in crop loss and reduced need for pesticide. So that is an unbelievable and really important figure to remember when we're advocating for bats. And yeah, as I mentioned, I mean, just in it being able to use less pesticide in general is, is hugely beneficial. Um, another benefit, so guano is bat poop and that's what we call it. And it's known to be a really great fertilizer. Also has been used in gunpowder. In bats caves that have large colonies, uh, it's probably pretty essential for the health of the cave, the cave nutrients. And this picture here is, I actually don't know where this picture is from. Um, this is massively giant pile. There would be no roosts of bats in Florida that would even come close to creating this type of a pile. But if you do have a small bat house and you have some guano underneath, you can use that for fertilizer. Um, one caution, and I you know, always wanna keep people aware, if you do have bat guano accumulating in an internal building, and you decide to go in there and sweep it up, you do wanna be careful because it can be a transmitter of a disease called histoplasmosis if once it becomes aerosolized. So you would definitely wanna wear um, some type of a face mask if you're doing that. Okay, bat exclusions. So this is a question that is a pretty frequently asked question in general. And especially kind of the towards the end of August is when a lot of questions uh, come up because bats are moving around a lot. This is the point where the young bats are starting to fly. So they've left the roost as well. So it kind of doubles the population of bats. Um, and so frequently that's when we get a lot of questions about doing exclusions. So when someone calls me and says, you know, they get, need to get rid of a bat or they found a bat, um, you know, the first thing I ask is you know, how many bats they found. Was this just one bat? And was it just a one bat that happened to be that they saw on the side of their shed? Um, in that case, it's probably fine. It probably doesn't need anything done with it. I'll probably fly away. Um, is there a bat inside the house? Most likely it wants to leave. Um, we always need to be very careful with bats inside of a house. Obviously, as I mentioned before, it is possible that they can carry rabies. Um, if we know that the bat was not in contact with anyone, then the best thing to do is try and open up all of the windows and doors and maybe just give the bat some time and see if it will fly out. We can also try and help the bat fly out. Um, if he needs some assistance, maybe use the end, long end of a broom, the brushy side, sometimes they'll just climb up on the end of that you can get them in an empty trash can or even go outside and lean that broom up against a wall and they might climb up um, a brick wall, climb up a wooden fence, and often they'll wait until nighttime and then they'll fly away. Now I do wanna make sure to note that if you do find a bat in the house and you're not sure if it did come in contact maybe with a small child, if they're not able to, someone that's not able to tell you for sure that they maybe got bit or not, then you would want to be cautious and probably catch that bat and have it taken and getting tested. But most likely they're just fine. Um, bats have trouble often flying off of the ground. So they really do need a kind of a drop zone to fly. So sometimes if they're found on the ground, they just accidentally ended up there. They might've gotten cold. Um, and often they just need a little help kind of getting to a better spot. Now, the other thing that question that we get is, well, they, they have a lot of bats um, or a colony. And so the one, first thing to remember is that it is illegal to conduct exclusions during this maternity season time. So that lasts from April 15th to August 15th. And that is again, because the moms are, that's a basically a colony of mothers that are having their pups, have had their pups, and have pups in the colony. 
And these pups cannot fly for say several weeks, a month. And so the moms are going out every night and feeding and coming back in the morning and then feeding their pups. So if we do an exclusion, and I'll explain what that is in a second, um, and we close up the attic or whatever, the building, and those pups will be trapped in there and they're not able to fly out. So an exclusion is when we basically figure out, say the bat, we've had bats in an attic, um, if there's only a few, say it's a small colony, say it's 10, 20 bats. I personally wouldn't maybe worry that much about it. Um, other people may be more concerned if they don't want them in the attic. Uh, you may have a much larger colony. They may be causing some type of um, comp, you know, damage from a lot of guano comp uh, compiling. Um, they may be getting into the interior of the house. So the first thing you really need to do is figure out how they're getting in to that area. And that's when you have to figure out how to close up all those areas, except for just one or a few of those openings. And so if bats can find an opening, they'll just keep going in and out. Um, Remember these bats are not very big and they can go through a space about a half an inch wide. They're very small, they can fit through a very small crack. So if you have cracks in your roof, in your wall that leads up into your, into your attic, uh, that bat can get through there. So you need to close up all the areas where the bat is potentially coming in and out, except for a several of them or maybe one. Then what happens is if you know the weather is going to be okay, meaning at least four nights of temperatures over 50 degrees, you can go ahead and put up what we call an exclusion device. Uh, these can vary depending on what type of situation you have and what your structure is like. Basically, it's any type of uh, mesh or sometimes a plastic tube that allows the bats to come out, but they struggle when they come back after they've gone out foraging, they can't really figure out what the, where the opening is and they can't really get back in. Um, so again, bats kind of need to, to drop, to fly. And so they have trouble kind of flying straight up and they have trouble flying into a straight tube with nothing to grab onto. So we put up the exclusion device. In this picture, these bats are flying out. And then the next morning when they come back, most of them are gonna have trouble trying to get back in. So if we leave that up for at least four nights, our assumption is that all the bats have left. And again, this is why we do this after maternity season, after the pups are flying, because we want the pups also to fly out. And if we do this during maternity season, when the pups are inside, then they're going to get trapped inside. You're gonna have, probably have dead bats in your attic, um, which is not a situation that you probably want. There, I will share at the end of this, um, there's a really great video that was actually created by FWC and IFAS and several other partners a few years ago that has a, it's like a 10 minute video and it goes through kind of the steps of how to do an exclusion. So I'll make sure to share that link at the end. So another frequently asked question uh, is about bat houses. Lots of questions about bat houses. So everyone always wants to know, especially if they're doing an exclusion, these questions often go hand in hand. They'll ask, oh, how do I, you know, I wanna put up a bat house and then the bats will just move out of my attic and move into the bat house, right? And the truth is we don't know that it's gonna happen. Um, the bats are probably in your attic because it's a really great spot and they like it there. So unless the bat house is also a really great spot, then they're not gonna choose to move in there. And there's no way to force them to go in there. They really have to choose to go in there on their own. So the best thing is to build a bat house with really good dimensions, really good size, and also really good placement. So a few just general tips on this. Um, size is the bigger is always better. And so the very smallest we kind of we recommend is about a one foot by two foot size bat house. And you can buy 
bat houses just kind of like online off of kind of random internet sites that are really tiny small bat houses and those are just not going to be effective so at a very very minimum we say one by two feet and kind of the reason for this is that bats like to have some options in the house so that they can move around depending on the weather depending on where the sun is depending on how warm it is they may want to be in a outside area of the house when it's cold out and they're trying to warm up they want to be in an upper left corner of the house when it's warmer out. Um, they like to have places that they can choose to move around. Also, a slightly larger house allows for a larger colony. So a lot of these bat species, the ones that do roost in colonies, they want to be with a, their group. So if the bat house is really tiny and it can only fit a few bats, then they're probably not going to choose to move in. Another tip right along with this idea that they want options, that they need more space for more bats is to have a multi-chamber house. So this house on the left with four chambers, much more ideal than this little one chamber house. That one chamber house does not provide very much option for them. So yeah, the more chambers, the better basically. Um, and you'll even see if you've been to the UF bat house, it is gigantic, many, many options in there. And you can even, there's lots of other houses that are bigger than a, bigger than these small houses, but kind of in the middle. Um, and the more options, the, the better. Another important thing that a lot of kind of prefabricated commercial houses don't have sometimes is a really good landing pad. And so basically the bats will land on the bottom area and then they need to climb straight up. And so they're climbing with either their little, their little thumbs or their little toes on their feet. And if they don't have something kind of that they can grip onto, they're not gonna be able to use the house. So that's another important thing. Um, also in general, temperature is again, very important. This is the critical thing. And there's a number of ways to account for the temperature. You don't want it too hot. You don't want it too cold. Um, someone the other day said it's like Goldilocks. Yes, they're like Goldilocks. They want it just right. And so consider the hours of sun in the location where you're going to put it. Um, there's also good recommendations for the color of the house. So in general, thinking kind of central Florida, we would usually recommend some light or medium color would be best because it does get quite warm here but also depending on if there's some shade during the day, um, they might need a little bit darker color to kind of absorb some of that warmth. Another important thing is that we don't want anyone else using the house because then the bats will not go in there. So we've found that if we make each chamber less than about three quarters of an inch wide, that the bats, that other, other animals won't go in there. So wasps are this issue. Also mud daubers are known to go in there. And so again, having this right structure is really important. So another thing I'll share with you at the end is several links um, to some websites that have plans that you can download and read about good ways to build a house, placement, um, all of these specifications, there's kind of plans you can download. If you have some good basic, basic woodworking skills and tools, you can actually build a house pretty easily. Okay, so um, almost done and then we'll have time for questions. So the other thing about placement of the bat house is we want to avoid predators. So owls and hawks and also snakes in Florida are definitely will try and get bats if they can. So we don't want to put our bat house on a tree that has a lot of branches. Um, not only does this make it hard for the bats to actually climb, like fly in there, but it's really great place for predators to hide. And things like snakes, it makes it much easier for them to be able to just climb in there and start eating uh, bat pups. So we want to avoid that. Good locations in general, uh, near water is great. Uh, bats like to come out and actually drink water. Also, a lot of insects will be around the water. So that's a nice location. The side of a building is often a really good location. 
it's open, clear of vegetation, um, often can be really good for sun orientation. And a pole is a fantastic place. Uh, this obviously takes a little bit more um, work as far as probably cementing a pole in the ground and making sure that's secure, but that is um, often a really good option. In general, some bad locations for a bat house. Again, mounting on trees, generally not a good idea. If you mount on the side of a metal building, we would not recommend that. It would be very hot and also um, just, I, I, just better to avoid. Um, mounting near a light is often a misconception. People see bats near the light, so they think that's a good spot. Uh, bats don't necessarily want to be seen when they're flying in and out of their house. So we don't need to mount it on a light pole would be a bad spot. And the other thing is to make sure it's at least at least 12 feet off the ground or higher. And this is so that bats have enough space so that when they drop out, they can get enough air to fly off. Okay, so in general, just to kind of wrap up, how can you help? If you do have uh, dead trees, trees that have these characteristics that I've been talking about, that bats actually naturally like to roost in, you know, palm fronds, all these things, if you can leave one or two of these trees with these characteristics, then do. They will, uh, that will be a good habitat for them. Um, if you have a large property and you have an old structure that is serving as habitat, and, you know, maybe leave that structure alone. At the very least, if you can leave it alone during the maternity season when they're maybe using that, that would be a great help to the bats. Spraying fewer pesticides ultimately can be beneficial. I mean, they're eating these insects that are potentially covered in pesticides. So we want to just be aware of that. Having open water access is, can be very important. Um, they do need kind of a larger, flatter body of water. I don't know that they would use something as small as a bird feeder. Um, that was a question I got recently, but um, generally, you know, by an open pond would be, is a really nice uh, feature for them. And as we just mentioned, you know, building a bat house. It's a fun thing to do. It gives them an option. There's no guarantee that they will use it, but it's there if they choose to use it. And lastly, I mean, I'm hoping that by sharing this information with you, that you are helping educate others on the habitat needs, the things to be careful of, things we need to protect, and ultimately to help conserve bats and bat habitat. And very last, I want to mention, uh, there is a group in the state, the Florida Bat Working Group, which I am um, active participant and member of. And most recently, we've kind of just launched this citizen science project where we actually want to try and track the use of bat houses. And so I will also share this link with you. And this is basically, if you have a bat house near you in your, in your backyard, or you put one up, then we're just hoping that you can go out, um, ideally during, during maternity season, but you can also do it before and after. And just basically, you. It, take a picture, you put in some info in the app and let us know like, did you see bats? Um, you know, how many were there? Kind of do a little mini exit count and then you submit that information. And my last slide, and then we'll have a questions for 10 minutes, is here's some of my most frequently shared resources. In general, Bat Conservation International is a very well-known and um, has an abundance of really good education materials available on their website. Uh, really good resource. The Florida Bat Working Group website has a lot of good resources as well. Our website is still growing, but we're starting to put more and more on there. And also the UF IFAS extension online resources. There's a lot of really quality bat resources on there, primarily written by uh, Dr. Holly Ober, who is was a bat expert in Florida, and she's now left for Oregon, but that is okay. We will still use her excellent documents. And so all of these resources are available online. Um, also, I'm always happy to share anything with you or give you advice if you need that, please go ahead and email me. So I'm happy to take questions. Also, it is my mother's birthday today, so I don't think she's watching, but happy birthday to my mom. And with that, 
I will go ahead and answer as many questions as I can. And I know I went a little bit long, so I can stay on a little bit later if people would like. Shelly, so I, I was capturing questions as they came in and I just posted most okay, of good. them all in one big <laughs> chat, if that's easy. Yes, I probably, because I noticed there was a lot of yeah. chatter. And actually, I know, like, I actually, one thing I love about this program is that there's such a variety of awesome experts also on the program that have a lot of really good background as well. And so often what happens is people will kind of start answering each other's questions. Um, but yeah, so I see your, your post, Lara. So vampire bats, I think I answered that and the hair answered that. Um, do bat colonies have a pecking order and or leaders? I do not necessarily know the answer to that. I do not think so, but maybe someone has a different answer to that. Um, I will say a really cool thing about the bat colonies is that the way that the mothers find their pups when they've all been out foraging and they come back is really amazing. I mean, there's really awesome videos of, of the you know thousand bat pups all in the roof of a cave and the moms are coming back in and they're scrambling through thousands of pups and they find their pup. So it's really pretty impressive when you see large colonies. Um, we see bats in our neighborhood in the evening occasionally. Is there anything we can do to increase our populations? Um, yeah, so I think I probably kind of touched on that. I mean, you can definitely try and make sure you're providing habitat for them. So whether that's a bat house or just providing some of those vegetation characteristics that I talked about, those are all things that will encourage bats to be there. Um, bats are eating the nightly insects. And so, you know, I know you don't want to increase the number of insects, but again, like thinking about not spraying a lot of pesticides can be beneficial because if bats are eating those insects that have pesticides on them, that can be bad. Um, we were told that bats don't eat many mosquitoes, not enough nutrient energy for expected effort. So different species eat different things. So some species, prey primarily on some of the small soft body mosquitoes, midges, and some eat more primarily uh, beetles or moths. So there are kind of different specialists. And certainly none of them are exclusive in just eating one single thing. So I, I would say a lot of them are opportunistic based on their capability and their foraging style and their ability to navigate. So those hover gleaner bats that can go slowly and like land on vegetation are more likely to eat things that are sitting on vegetation, like beetles. So I think it's a mix of um, a diet and basically there none of them are just eating all mosquitoes. Even though we talk about mosquitoes a lot because it's something that people can relate to really well. Um, comment about fungus. I'm guessing this is related to white nose syndrome. Are caves in Florida generally warmer than those farther north? Mm, I will admit I don't know the answer to that. Um, as all, all that I do know is that as far as I know, we have not detected any white nose syndrome in Florida caves, but I don't know if I am not, not an expert enough on white nose syndrome to be able to tell you for sure why. Um, I like woodwork and have my own mill, be interested in making bat houses. So yeah, so I'll share the designs and I'll, I guess I can do that really quick right now before people start leaving. Um, so these are the three links at the bottom that I was going to share for those three items. And then also, before I forget, um, we have a few minutes left and I'll keep answering questions, but I'm gonna launch a poll really quick. It's just a few questions about what you learned or didn't learn today. So if you can answer that before you sign off, that would be really appreciated. And so back up to the questions. Can you please share the study you pulled the diet on mosquitoes information from? I, we tend to avoid saying they are useful for mosquito control, even though they are able to eat large amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will have to dig up 
some resources on that. Um, and so I don't know who asked this question, but I can certainly share that. I can even share that in the blog post, perhaps, share, share some resources. Um, I will probably repost this video on the blog as its own post at some point. So I can also share some resources there. But definitely contact me directly if you want to try and get more resources. And I'm happy to look, try and look those up for you. Are rabid bats symptomatic? If so, how? So yeah, rabid bats, so bats can harbor rabies for a long time and not show symptoms, but they will also become symptomatic. And that's often what we see uh, converse to a lot of other species where they get um, kind of really, uh, you know, drooling and foam. And we think of like kind of vicious kind of behavior. Uh, bats are often exhibiting rabies symptoms by being very docile and like kind of without a lot of energy. And the problem with that is that's also a normal behavior if they've become cold or ended up on the ground and are maybe going into torpor. So that's why it's really hard to tell just by looking at them to know that if they're sick or not. Um, someone asked about the rocket box design. And yes, that's another new bat design that I have heard good things about. Um, there's definitely some other in the probably I think on the BCI website page, there's definitely some plans on there for that one if you want to do that. It's kind of more of a um, rectangle inside of a rectangle inside of a rectangle design. And so that also the idea is it gives bats more options to thermoregulate inside the box. Um, do attractants work? I don't, I'm not sure what that, I'm not sure what that question is. Um, I'm not sure, attractants, I'm guessing to get them to move into a bat house, maybe? If that's the question, no. <laughs> the only thing that will get them to move into the bat house is building a really good bat house and putting it in a place that they want and then having a bat colony that's looking for a house. So we often tell people, I would leave your bat house up for at least a year, probably two, in order to see if bats will move in. People tend to get a little bit impatient and they have it up for a couple months, no bats, they take it down. And the truth is if it's maternity season, that colony is not gonna move in the middle of maternity season. So that could be six months where they're kind of staying in the same roost. So maybe wouldn't even be until the fall, winter, when bats are kind of moving around, they're finding different roosts, they're moving different, different roosts, they're kind of experimenting in different areas. And so they might find your house at that point. Um, they might not, it might not be until even the next fall. So generally you just have to be patient. And if there's a group of bats looking for a home, then they might choose your house. Um, let's see. Someone asked, is, so it is four o'clock. Um, there's a few more questions. I'll stay on for a couple more minutes, five more minutes and answer questions. And then we will, we will call it quits. Um, is there a UF research happening with the FBB? I don't know what FBB is. It might've been the working group. Oh, Florida bonded bat. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. Um, now I have to find the question again. Yes, th there's a lot of research going on with the Florida bond and the bat. Um, there's, so Holly Ober was doing a lot of research. Um, she still has grad students here that are finishing up research. Um, since it's federally endangered, there's been you know, a fair amount of funding in order to do research and really try and learn more about where it's located, the habitat it's using and the population size. So if you're interested in more information on who's doing that work, um, definitely email me and I can share, share that with you. I lost the questions. Bat house on a cabbage palm. Not the worst place, but I do think about snakes potentially being able to pretty easily get in there. I imagine snakes can climb up a cabbage palm pretty well. Um, but it's better than like a pine tree with a bunch of branches. So, I don't know. Um, what is the name of the bat house tracking app? 
So the bat house tracking app, basically the best way to find that is to go to that link that I shared to the Florida bat working group page, and you have to kind of download it using a code. So you go into a survey one, two, three app, and then you download this specific survey. So it's kind of a two-step process. But once it's on your phone, then I think it will automatically come up. So if you go to the Florida Bat Working Group page, you should be able to um, go to the Citizen Science page and all the information is on there. Why don't use bats use echolocation to protect themselves against flying into those big turbines? That is a good question. Um, and I haven't honestly followed up on a lot of that research in the most recent years. Certainly a while back, there's been a lot of research on that. And even after they adapted the turbines so that birds were less likely to run into them, the migrating bats were still, were still running into them. And so there were some theories that the bats were in some ways kind of attracted to them. Um, and they had some cool like infrared video showing bats actually coming towards them and kind of trying to interact with them. Um, but yeah, I don't know the most recent research on that, but that's a good question. Um, thank you for the, thank you for the thank yous. Um, someone asked about bats swooping over their pool. Are they drinking or eating bugs? Um, they could be doing both. Absolutely. I don't know that pool water is good for them, but I don't know if that means they wouldn't drink it. So. Depends on the species. Okay, that's an answer. Do we have fruit pollinator bats in Florida? No, we do not. All of the bats in Florida are insectivorous. So um, the only fruit pollinating bats in the US would be potentially down in maybe Southern Arizona, right on the border. Uh, Mexico certainly has some fruit pollinating bats. The coronavirus question. Okay, last question. Um, I don't know that I want to end on this one. I don't know. So all I know, uh, I guess I can share about coronavirus in bats is that in general, coronavirus, coronaviruses are common in bats is from what I read. Also, as I mentioned before, bats are really efficient at harboring a lot of viruses. And to my knowledge, the most recent information that's come out is that there's no sound evidence that this most recent outbreak came directly from bat interaction. Um, it is possible that it came through a secondary interaction, like a bat uh, interacted with another animal that spread that virus to that animal, and then it ended up being interacted with humans. And so it's, Again, this comes back to the more we encroach on habitat, the more we interact with wildlife, the more chance it is that we contract diseases from them because they cannot get away from us. All right, it is 4.05, so we will go ahead and finish up. I thank everyone so much for being here. Uh, this was really fun for me to do. I'm hoping maybe next year I can present on bats again around this time of year and maybe on some different topics. And I will let everyone know that next month, the let's see, third Thursday of the month at 3 p.m., we will have our last talk of 2021, which will be on invasive, invasive reptiles in Florida. So we have the Southern Florida, um, the UFIFAS croc docks, and they're going to talk about uh, invasive all those invasive reptiles that are in South Florida that we need to get rid of. So that should be a really, really interesting talk. And then we won't have a program in December. And then there'll be a new calendar out pretty soon, hopefully starting for January and February next year. So I look forward to seeing everyone back next month. And uh, thank you all for being here. Mm -hmm.